few days, everybody and their brother is sending me emails and pictures of evening roast beaks in their backyard. Wow. And they're from all over the place. They're from Alderville. They're from uh, the west, west end of Coburg. They're from, uh, who else had evening roast beaks? Well, several places. Yeah, so, several places around, around the county have had evening roast beaks. Some of them have had only one or two, but several people have re reported as many as a dozen at their feeders. So be prepared. If you're running a feeder, you might have some evening roast beaks and you'll go broke buying sunflower seeds if they stay around. <laughs> yeah. um, so what else has anybody seen? Margaret, you had some, some good things today. We had a, a good hawk flight at um, Trenere or Trent Valley Road. The winds were northeast and we had 11 goldens, 11 golden eagle. Wow. Uh, wow. They, they, were wow. Flying, they were flying high, but right along the lake shore. We had one group that had four together, and then we just had ones and twos the whole time we were there. We had uh, three bald eagles, uh, had an osprey that was a bit late. We had a dozen bluebirds on the fence post. So um, it was really, um, really a good, a good day. But yeah. we've been up there a couple of times before that wasn't so good. So today made up for it. Yeah, that's wonderful, Margaret. Thank you. Uh, Simona Ann, you've been regularly at, at Lake Street Marsh. Have you had anything interesting there? Yes. Um, well, go ahead, Ann. <laughs> Okay, um, so earlier in the week, I think Tuesday, I had a small flock of snow buntings fly into my car on Lake Street. They were wow. probably 15 or 20, and they all survived. Um, and we've been watching the lake. There have been about 5,000 red-breasted mergansers flying from west to east on the lake, just going by constantly. Yeah, that's quite spectacular when that happens. Yeah. Your turn, Simone. Okay, well today I had at least a dozen uh, evening grass beaks. Yeah. And after Anne came to see them and she just turned her back, <laughs> there was a pine siskin. Oh, okay. Oh. On my feeder. And <clears throat> eagles down by the lake, but nothing like what Marguerite, Margaret saw. And of course, we also saw flocks of uh, greater scalp and uh, redheads, but there were in 5,000 of those, unlike <laughs> Monday or Tuesday. They, they just went back and forth. We began counting, you know, hundreds, 200, 1,000, and so on. It was just amazing. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Anybody else? You can all chip in if you like. Uh, do, do, do speak forward. <laughs> Katsu, can you report from the park? You've just come back. Yes, I back a uh, couple of days ago. I know, you've, but you've just come back from Algonquin. So uh, other than all the, all the moose that you saw, amazing. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Although today I saw a Cooper's hog right in my backyard. Mm -hmm. what, what was it eating? Uh, I think it's there uh, waiting for a pigeon flying by or something. I think it's, I heard <laughs> the pigeon or uh, like a chickadees in the round. So I think they just uh, flew up in uh, one of my uh, trees. Okay. Yeah. So that's, did they just coming to the park? Pardon? Were there lots of finches coming to the park? Uh, yes, uh, a few days before I left, uh, uh, yeah, actually quite a few evening gross beaks just showed up and snow buntings and then uh, I haven't really uh, saw a cross, uh, cross belt, but I think that other visitors saw that too. So I think it's going to be a lot of finches here and there this year. Yeah, siskin? Any siskin? Uh, yes, I saw a few siskins, not many yet. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Yeah, Elizabeth, it's Ken Bagshaw. I'm uh, on a screen that I'm identified as Esther Robson. Oh, okay. So you're, you're, you're sitting beside me, but out of the scene. 
and I'm not one of your regular reporters nor very sophisticated what? about this, but I wanted to uh, report, because I didn't hear anybody else mention it, that on October 24th at about 11 a.m. <clears throat> on uh, Victoria Beach in uh, Coburg was a, um, <clears throat> a uh, turkey vulture feasting on uh, what looked like the remnants of a cormorant. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and there, there have been uh, ruddy ducks and coots in Coburg Harbor as well. Oh, wow. A uh, pair of ruddy ducks and a uh, couple of coots. I'll have to check Coburg Harbor. I haven't been over there for a little while. Mm, no, it's been very quiet until recently. This morning, our, our uh, Carolina wren was calling from the backyard. There's Roger. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that hangs out in the um, in the ravine at the end of our street in the west end of the west end of the portal. Oh, I forgot to add. We oh, have Louise. There's Louise. Louise is visiting from Nova Scotia. Oh, are you? I thought you you were there. Are you in Nova Scotia, Louise, or are you in Ontario? I think oh, she's in Nova your, Scotia. You have to turn your microphone on. No, I I am in Nova Scotia. Yes. <laughs> Welcome, Lucy. Louise. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. And you can do with the internet. I guess that's one benefit of this is that I can attend meetings. <laughs> it's great. awesome. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Welcome. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. I really appreciate it. The, the grouse beaks were so exciting. I forgot about the sanderlings that we saw. Off Gages Creek. Just recently? Yeah, today. There were five or six. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and today we had the male and female cardinal at our feeder on Rice Lake. Yeah. And they've probably been unusual up there, yeah? Well, this is the first time we've seen them for about three, four months. Okay. Yeah. You were talking about the evening grosbeaks eating all the seed. You should try and come to my place where all the blue jays are. <laughs> I've gone through so much. I've gone through one huge bag of seed already. Oh, wait till the grosbeaks find you, Anne. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm feeding an army army of blue jays with, with uh, peanuts. <laughs> oh, my goodness, yeah. Nobody's mentioned purple finches. No? What do you got, Richard? Well, I've uh, had four purple finches, males and females, competing with the house finches all week, which is, for <laughs> me, unusual because we have so many house finches, we rarely get purple finches. But they've been being seen all over, and they're even turning up in my backyard, so I thought that was positive. The second thing was uh, that uh, we have had, somebody may have mentioned it, but we've had you know, 10 or 12 Bonaparte's gulls uh, also in the harbor. Wow. Harbor hasn't been, as Margaret said, not all that good, but we have had the uh, bonies. And one of the ruddy ducks, I think, may have croaked because I saw it sitting on algae and it was there all day and it never moved when I went close to it. Uh, so I'm hoping it survived. But... Roger had an interesting sighting one day last week when he was having lunch in his car in the parking lot at No Frills in Coburg. Oh, yeah. He had, with, along with a lot of turkey vultures, there was one black vulture. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So nice. that, that's an unusual sighting for the county. Yeah. Mm. Anything else, Richard? What have you got? What have you been just seeing? Richard Jordan. Oh, oh, Richard Jordan. You haven't got your mic on. Sorry. Sorry, uh, I didn't have my mic on, no. Yeah. Uh, I did, I had seen some uh, Bonaparte gulls um, over at uh, Lucas Point uh, Park this past week. And um, I had uh, I think one redhead duck at, in the harbor uh, uh, last week. And, but uh, other than that, uh, um, not a lot. Okay, thank you. Is Michael Bigger on today? I, didn't, I haven't seen him. Well, he's, he's regularly been reporting a fairly large flock of wild turkeys in his backyard. Yes. He's, you know, he's a, has a field in his backyard, but there's a fairly large number of them. So. I gather he told me he was sending his wife out to keep 
buying bags of food to feed them. Yeah, she went to the co-op for some crack corn. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I did, I did have uh, my first junk over the season uh, this uh, past week as well on okay. in, in town here. Junkos are around my yard too. Anything else? So junkos are here. If you have open area, you can look for tree sparrows. They're probably around. Uh, when you go down to the harbor, look for the snow buntings, or if you're in agricultural fields, maybe snow buntings. Um, and I think the finches are going to be good this year. So uh, stock up your feeders and have a look. Okay. okay. Over to you, Tim. Thank you, Elizabeth. A super job as always. Anyway, I want to extend a very warm welcome to Leslie Sampson. She is co-founder of the not-for-profit organization Coyote Watch Canada. She's a graduate of Brock University with honors. She has worked as a certified secondary educator for the District School Board of Niagara, teaching geography, science, and tourism. In 1997-98, while conducting her thesis involving the observation movement analysis of candid pack behavior, Leslie founded the Greek Park Coyote Education and Research Project to advocate coexistence between people and coyotes. Boy, I got to know that. Well, with our where we live here, we hear the coyotes almost nightly. As a co-founder of the not-for-profit organization in 2008, Coyote Watch Canada, under the direction of Leslie, continues to develop a community science-based educational model that emphasizes and fosters compassionate wildlife coexistence. CWC offers a 24-hour hotline that provides frontline community and coyote support. Enough for me. Let's hear from Leslie. Leslie? <laughs> Thank you, Tim, for that great, uh, that, that wonderful introduction. And I think I need to get to the screen, the share screen. Do I not? This shall be interesting. Amy, uh, help. Okay, <laughs> Jamie, I am going to go into share screen. Now, are folks leaving their mics on or off during? Uh, some people have been leaving them on, but, uh, I'm gonna you know, see. share screen here. Um, I'm hoping this is the right one. Let's see. Yeah, I think so. Well, is it? Yeah. Okay. You just have to go to the first slide. Yes. slideshow. Yay. Now, so everybody can hear me, correct? Yep. It's all good? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Now I am going to try the video tonight. We'll give it one try. I'll, I'll kick myself out and get back in because somebody helped me with it. So I'm hoping that it works. Am I, is my voice bouncing now? Just a little bit. It's looking good. Okay. Let me just see um, about my um, sound. Remember what I had to do last time with this? With your the microphone? Voice coming, your, your voice is coming across very well. Oh, so it's not bouncing or anything? No. Okay, because I can hear somebody's background then. It's, it's uh, kind of bouncing or something. Anyway, okay, I am going to... X out of the screen. Can I do that, Jamie? Uh, w the, which screen are you trying to X out of? Well, I can't see my screen. Wait, a oh, there we go. Okay, so thank you so much for that and welcome everybody. Um, it's a real joy. I think, Tim, we worked on this last year, booking this uh, talk. So now sometimes with uh, Zoom, I notice it wants to dictate how fast the slides go. So if I do have to skip back once in a while, um, please forgive me. So uh, pretty much Tim went through everything, um, who Coyote Watch Canada is. We have a uh, really fabulous, uh, all volunteer, everyone that 
contributes Leslie, to if I can watch. Leslie, yep. if I can interrupt for a second. Jamie, I'm just yep. getting a screen that says click to add title. Yeah, that's all I'm getting. You're seeing a screen that says click to add title. Yeah, and yeah. the, 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 um, um, the slides are on the There left. it is. Oh, okay, there we are. Can you see it now? Oh, yep. oh, sorry. You're just seeing a blank PowerPoint slide. That's what you were seeing. Yep. Oh, okay. There we are. are. Good no, now? It's, it, it's coming through perfectly. Yep. Okay, perfect. And tell me, please don't let me keep talking if my voice starts doing that scrapey thing again. <laughs> okay, so um, our science advisory and um, our advisory council really lend a great deal to what we're able to um, support and provide and implement and facilitate in communities. It's really, uh, we, we've, we're very blessed with the, the folks and we have artists and photographers, birders, all sorts of contributors that help um, keep Coyote Watch Canada in the pulse of the community. And so we have established canine response teams nationwide. And um, so essentially what we do, uh, we have mobilized response on the ground. And so we, we can also do uh, securement and rescue for uh, transport to rehabilitation facilities. We research partnership development and we also have um, uh, also investigation. So we will do uh, field investigative work, not just for research purposes, but to mitigate areas of conflict for municipalities or government agencies. And then yeah. we, pro we provide the data and the evidence and then the report. Yeah. I don't, I can't, I'm really, I'm hearing a lot of noise. I can't even hear. Jamie, are you hearing what I'm hearing or not? No, I'm I can hear you and I'm hearing a little bit of something else, but it's not bad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think I'm hearing background, like people's microphones, maybe. All right. I'm going to do a little bit of altering. Just yeah, continue probably. for now. Yeah. Okay. So, and as you know, we're all volunteer. We do um, offer uh, in, in capacity of consultation. So if folks need to, um, reach out to us over the phone. We can offer um, our guidance or uh, direction through that venue, or we can actually um, travel and do, of course, with COVID, it's not possible right now, but and our premise is the science education and coexistence. So like everyone else, we've adjusted um, to, uh, you know, a, a world right now with COVID. One thing for us, though, we're doing field work. So um, a lot of our public engagements, any social um, gatherings, we've had obviously had to, um, you know, reschedule all of those. We had uh, 11 training sessions across Canada that were scheduled. We had to put those off. We've done some virtual training, uh, which was different. It's not the same as being face to face, but you know, for the most part, though, um, <clears throat> our representatives already had safety gear with the N95s and all of the, the tools that we need. So um, COVID, besides uh, just really keeping social distancing and masking up, we're still pretty good with all of that. And so we work within a, a framework and it's a four cornerstone approach. And each component, each cornerstone is vital in terms of being able to uh, create and cultivate uh, coexistence for communities. And so the investigation, education, enforcement, and prevention, uh, when we uh, embark on a new partnership with a new community, uh, we really emphasize the importance of striving to uh, you know, create and meet the needs of all of those four cornerstones and each community is different. And so some might have two already, you know, working really well. Um, funding can be an issue, but there's always ways um, that we can help a community uh, create their, um, you know, four cornerstone uh, framework, which will push them ahead to be able to mitigate and be able to celebrate the presence of the Eastern Coyote. And so this is just a, a quick case study. I physically 
run the program for the Niagara region. Because I'm located here, I'm the key canine response team lead for this area. And um, so essentially, we have uh, any information that has to do with canids, fox, coyotes, um, obviously we wouldn't be get, getting uh, wolf reports down here, but um, so we have intake calls through the hotline. We have sighting reports and email and the website. And so two different uh, portals, the city of Niagara Falls and also the city of St. Catharines and then our website. Any reports that come through immediately are filtered to my personal cell phone. So we always have our pulse on, you know, situations that could be, um, you know, pressing or an animal that's in really uh, dire need of assistance. And so the great thing about this hierarchy for response and action is that the information doesn't get lost somewhere. It's going to fil filter down really nice like a river. It flows quite well and everybody is providing information and there's communication, whether it's with police, our SPCA, Niagara Falls Humane Society, City of Niagara Falls. And then from there, so a report comes in and then I would get my team out and do the investigative work, do the interviews, um, field rescue, whatever the need is. And then the conflict resolution process begins. And that involves a great many partners, sometimes the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry might be part of that if we did an investigation and there was some uh, regulation, um, you know, uh, maybe there'd be charges involved or whatever. So we would be calling them in and it, it's, it works really well. And so as far as canid conservation for Ontario, so we have the Algonquin wolf on the right and that's beautiful Steve uh, uh, Dunsford's photo and that's an Eastern coyote in the middle, the gray, and then of course our fox. Um, there really isn't a heck of a lot for canids in Ontario, especially Southern Ontario, around the Algonquin areas, wildlife management units. Um, you know, there are some select few, uh, but that is for the preservation of the endangered Algonquin wolf. But because you cannot really tell them apart without genetic analyses, um, Eastern coyotes are able to have some protection under that. But down here where I live, it's 365 days, um, you know, seven days a week. You can kill a coyote just for walking by. Excuse me, Liz, and, are you changing your slide? Yeah. Because I haven't no. slides. I'm still on slide number two. Oh. Oh, suit. I think you have to change oh. the slides. Yeah. Oh, I have been. No, what you have to do is you have to start the slideshow. You're on the PowerPoint uh, uh, raw uh, presentation, raw uh, uh, manipulation software. You're not displaying the uh, PowerPoint presentation. We're it's still on slide two. The slides that you would be working on. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh. Okay, yeah, I've gone, I've probably covered five or you six know, slides. Like that little icon at the bottom of the screen that has a little, where well, it's supposed to be a computer on a stalk, a screen on a stalk, which will then. Oh, thank you. Okay. Jamie, can um, you help her? There we are. No, no, you're not there yet. There's a little, there's a little icon on the bottom, bottom row. Uh, and it's, uh, it gets you into. Uh, so what? Um, display mode, slide slow, slideshow mode. Oh, that's very strange. Okay. Um, geez, here I'm thinking I, so should I start over and go right into no. the beginning? No, no, just carry on. Fine, just carry on. Okay, is it working though? Yes. Yeah, okay, it's now. <clears throat> Yeah, it's not now. I my my uh, screen is froze. It's not doing anything. Try try your, your your arrows up and down. Yeah, I'm doing that. It's very odd. Um, uh, try clicking on the slide, maybe. No, my my uh, computer like 
it's not moving now. For me, it was moving before, and now you folks can see it, but no, uh, this is crazy. Um, well, hit escape and go back to PowerPoint, then go to the slide you want to display, and then uh, click the little icon to get it onto a video, onto uh, display mode. Okay, so we're gonna try it again. All right, share screen. Okay, is uh, can you folks see this now or yeah, not? Yeah. The PowerPoint program. Yes, uh, can you go into slideshow now? Yeah, current slide, can I do? Yeah. D are you looking at, well, are you actually, looking no, at Katie Claus? A little icon down at the very bottom of the screen. Oh, you got it. Because when you go into current slide, you're just going into current slide. You're not going into the in, into into the into the uh, PowerPoint presentation as a whole. Oh dear, this is crazy. Okay, so who's talking to me? I can't see. Who is it directing me? I th I'm talking. I don't know if I'm being. Heard. Oh, there you are. Yes. Okay. It says Julian. Yeah. Okay. So I'm. I'm going into my PowerPoint now. It says PowerPoint slideshow. That's where yeah. I'm at. Yeah. So what are you instructing me to do here? Well, down at the very bottom uh, of the screen towards the left, uh, towards the right hand side, uh, there's a, a little box on a stalk. And I think it seems, I think that represent that icon represents once upon a time when we had uh, uh, video monitors on stands. So the little the little icon with a with, with a box on a stalk we should get you into. Okay, it's uh, okay. At the bottom of the screen, I see uh, fifty four percent, which is the the magnification size, and you keep on going towards the left, and you see a little icon. Yes. That one. That's the one. Click. Okay. So it should go to slide show now. Okay. Are we good? Good. No, now if you hit the, hit the uh, up arrows up and no, down, it's, you ought it's, to be able to scroll no, through the slides. It's not, it's not, not working for me. Uh, that's, a, that's a drag. Okay, the next thing I suggest is that you go back out of that and you go to your power. You're going to have to do a bit of a hack, I think. You're going to have to go to the PowerPoint program and you're going to have to click on the slide that you want to view. <laughs> And maybe just go, just use the PowerPoint program itself, and not go to the, um, uh, and not go to the full screen display because you seem to be freezing up there. We can see the PowerPoint program quite well. I can anyway. I can too. Okay, I'm I'm completely frozen here now. There's nothing. I haven't had this happen. So I'm trying, I have Canid Conservation and I'm looking at it and it's stuck. I can't get out of the screen. Uh, try hitting escape. I did. Yeah. It's not happening. Yeah. It's I tried nothing. the computer on the floor. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah. Why don't it's you not try... happening. <laughs> okay, so if it's frozen, then uh, try closing your document and reopening it. Well, I can't get out of... The, the slide that says Canid Conservation. Okay. Oh, so I'm yeah. stuck there. No, it's, right. uh, try it's using Windows. Mm -hmm. It's a Windows operating system. Try pressing the little Windows icon uh, and tab at the same time. And see if you can move out of the um, move, move out of the Zoom program and then get straight to the PowerPoint program. Yeah, I can't even, uh, it's, it's frozen. This has never happened. This is a new computer. I have no idea. Okay, so if, if you're absolutely stuck, then there's uh, another way of fixing it. And what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to turn your computer off uh, and then turn it right back on. But in order to do that, you're gonna have to leave Zoom. Okay. So do you wanna just try doing that? Oh boy. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, I will try that. And um, just before yeah. you go, have you tried hitting the window icon and the tab icon simultaneously? 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank well, no, I, no, all, oh, okay. Hmm. Windows and tab okay. icons simultaneously should get you out to all your different pr programs that you're running. All I see is a black screen in my slide. Yeah. That's all I have. There's yeah, no. I think you're going to have to hit Control Alt Delete. <clears throat> <laughs> really? Okay. All right. I will. See you in five minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Oh dear Lord. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Okay. Oh. Okay. Switch users. Sign out. We could always get Sarah to, who's in a mask, to lead a sing song or something. <laughs> so, has anyone else seen any good birds lately? Just to go back to that topic. Because I had eight eastern bluebirds just the other day, and I saw them again today, actually, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. Where is everybody? Oh, there. And uh, I don't know, can you hear me? It's Carolyn here. I can't unmute fully. Ah. Is anyone having trouble unmuting? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Carolyn? Oh, okay, good. I'm okay. I was just going to say that uh, two weekends ago on Thanksgiving Sunday, we had. 50 plus red winged blackbirds come flying through and being up in our trees. Wow. So that was our, that was our big, big sighting up here. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. We haven't had pine systems or any of the other exciting ones yet. If anybody's interested in Wolf Island, uh, I was on Wolf Island for a day on Saturday and had about 50 species. Uh, I guess the best things were there were hundreds and hundreds of pippets in the fields. Uh, so if anybody's interested in horned larks and pippets and things like that and uh, lots of rusty blackbirds down at Big Sandy Bay and uh, nothing really unusual, uh, but lots of the kind of things we don't see in big numbers like pippets and Rusties and things like that. Horned larks. And... On, on October the October the thirteenth, I did have a, a winter wren at the west end of town, the wooded area um, beyond the west end of King Street. Um, a lot, um, there's a little stream runs down there. There's a concrete bridge, pa uh, wood footbridge across the stream, and uh, just about fifty feet beyond that, there was a, a winter wren. Hopefully it's around for the winter. Ah, cool. So we have a Coopers that uh, flies by and tries to have lunch on a regular basis. That's cool. Mm -hmm. well, maybe not so quite cool if you like looking at your songbirds, but you know. No, no, raptors are always cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. We had uh, at uh, the day Margaret and I, besides the eagles, we did have uh, harriers and Cooper's hawks uh, and sharp shins and uh, a number of ravens uh, and turkey vultures. Uh, the stars were the eagles, uh, but we had a good smattering of uh, harriers and Cooper's hawks and things like that migrating as well. So any of the next uh, Tuesday and any of these days with north winds, uh, uh, those raptors are still moving. And the eagles, the goldens, will be moving for another 10 days or more. So if people are interested, they can keep a weather eye out for the eagles. Mm. Excellent. Uh, where are you going exactly, Richard? Trent Valley Road, uh, you go up Ventress Road. When you're heading towards Presque Isle, you pass something called Ventress Road, the other side of Colburn. Mm -hmm. And uh, you turn left and go up to Trent Valley Road. It's the first road. And it only runs to the right or to the east. 
and you just go along there about not quite halfway uh, and stop. And if you look out to your right, you can see High Bluff Island and Gull Island and Presque Isle down below. Uh, and you've got a panorama of the lake and uh, head the, the, the birds are coming from uh, east to west. So you can look north and look east and then follow them out as they go along the shoreline. Sometimes they go oh. right up to the lake, Gull Island. But Who's this? Oh, hi, Leslie. I'm doing... Ah, that's, that's, that's nice. Thank you, Richard. I can email you closer directions, maybe, but you don't go quite as if you if you hit Trenier Road, you've gone too far. You've missed Ventress Road, and if you hit Trenier Road, turn left and go up the hill to the first road and come back on Trent Valley Road halfway. It's halfway between those two roads, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, if that's where we we had about ten or twelve bluebirds today, and we always get them there, and. You get snow buddings and larks, and we had a savanna sparrow and things like that. And, but it's an excellent hawk watching spot because you've got the commanding view down out down the hill and out over the lake and the islands. Uh, any fox a sparrow? It's been my nemesis. I had them on Wolf Island, but not not recently here. Yes, I had one about three or four days ago in my backyard in Coburg. Uh, the other interesting thing we had up on the, that sort of drumlin where you go a little bit higher to see these eagles uh, was there was a great big flight of brant um, coming down from the Arctic. And it was about the middle of the day and they were just coming through in hundreds flying south and they must have left the Arctic on, at the daybreak on that same day. And then by uh, afternoon, they would be in Delaware Bay. It was really uh, an amazing sight. Wow. All right, so I think... We are almost back on schedule. That looks good. Yeah. Jamie, can you unmute Leslie? Uh, I can. Uh, I can't actually, but I can ask her to unmute. Okay. There, there we, we go. go. Okay. Welcome now, back. where am I? Yeah. Okay. How do I get this this thing out of the way, though? Can I X that out? Because I see a screen now. Yeah, I see Coyote Watch Canada insights into human coyote dynamics. Yeah, can I X that? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't do that because I think that's the screen you're sharing. Please. Okay. So what you need to do is move down. Okay. There. Um, so we have our attitudes, right? Depending on our upbringing, culture, um, what we were exposed to um, growing up. And of course, you know, the wily coyote and wolves, <laughs> all that historical context for our attitudes and you know we can be uh carrying beliefs and perceptions that maybe aren't really based in reality or facts so i think for coyotes that they're that um epitome of a species that evokes a great deal of emotion we have a saying in in our um, research circles uh wolves are sexy fox are cute and then people if they're going to dislike anything, they're going to dislike the Eastern coyote, but to really uh, get to know the species, you, you 
would really fall in love, right? So that's patches again. And, um, you know, we have the, the coyote that we have in our mind and the stories that manufacture fear in us and misunderstanding and disinformation. Um, it really does open the door for this amazing sentient species to be uh, treated quite horrifically at times. And so if you really see the vibrancy and the color of the species and the essential nature and the fact that, you know, it is a keystone species, the Eastern coyote, um, you know, getting to know who they are um, biologically, ecologically, and in our communities, it's pretty fascinating. And I think facts are more exciting than uh, storytelling anyway. And so thinking about becoming a champion in your community, you can provide uh, sighting intel, photographs, maybe, you know, an artist. You, we uh, often, when we would do presentations uh, in communities, we would reach out months in advance and inspire an art show that would feature or highlight local artists, uh, you know, sculptors and photographers and painters and poetry uh, writers and all sorts. So there's a really great, great uh, ways in which to um, build up uh, a better, uh, I guess, uh, you know, a, a attention to these, these animals. So social media has a huge influence. There's been many, many studies. Uh, actually, one of our um, science advisors, Dr. Shelley Alexander, um, she did quite compelling research about um, the media and the influence on people. And so I think as consumers of information, especially during this time, um, with the promotion of so much, you know, people use the term fake news, but um, we have to really be careful what we're taking in as and basing that as fact and reality. And coyotes are often in the center, uh, the nucleus of some pretty dramatic uh, stories. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes? Yep. Tim? Okay. And so those headliners, um, you know, we live with a species that is from the same canid family as uh, eastern coyotes and wolves, fox and jackals, um, our lovely domestic dogs, of which probably most of you have an animal or two at home. Um, and we sometimes have some very ambiguous relationships with even our domestic pets. So I think we have to be really careful and appreciate that although these uh, animals do come from the same family, they live by their own terms and they do not need our help as far as food and so forth goes. Um, and oftentimes when folks are reading uh, newspaper articles or hearing you know, reports on, on the radio, um, unless that journalist is doing investigative work and really seeking answers, uh, oftentimes this story isn't quite as accurate as it should be. So context is everything. So this is the kind of photograph that would be uh, great for somebody that really wanted to garner a lot of likes and shares on social media, but it's really not that exciting. It's Patches yawning, but her teeth are nice and white and long. And, and you know, when an animal, we know our dogs, when they yawn, their teeth are showing. And, uh, you know, this, uh, this kind of photograph would be um, a real good hook for folks to be sharing all over the media about the vicious nature of coyotes. If you notice here, the uh, gum area there, her teeth are rotten because of the gentleman that was feeding her dog food. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And so um, for folks that have a little bit of a weak stomach, this slide here um, was actually shared a million times on social media. And it came out um, two winters ago. It was very prominent and uh, our organization recognized um, that there were some not uh, really great things going on in this photograph, but the dialogue and the way that it's presented is that coyotes are uh, more vicious when it's mating season and that they lure your dogs and they want to lure your dogs. They use their, the pregnant female or the uh, female in heat that will draw your beloved pet out. And then the pack, they use the term pack, will kill them. 
And so, um, but from an analysis, uh, if you're used to looking at um, photos for evidence, you can see here clearly that this photograph isn't really telling the complete story because the coyote's legs are not in a natural position. And you can see also the saliva uh, markings at the back ends and some a little bit up at the top here. So the next slide is a bit disturbing, but this is the reality and what is really happening in this slide. And this coyote is actually on a trap line, but what you see in social media is the top photo and it's been circulated and the dialogue has been circulated. So it's really important for you to understand what you're looking at. Um, we actually addressed this in a blog and this year, I think we might have seen it maybe half a dozen times on social media. Our blog went, reached about 300,000 people, which was really a great thing for educating the public in terms of what they're consuming as, uh, you know, the context and not really understanding what's going on. Um, so if you look at coyotes in the context of risk, and see folks, as soon as the coyote crosses the school ground, or I mean, they don't have political boundaries, any kind of wild animal, be it bear, cougar, coyote, wolf, fox, even raccoon, depending on a level of uh, wildlife education and exposure, um, our risk is pretty, pretty slim to none with coyotes. There's been two recorded uh, deaths um, by coyotes in all of history of this animal. So I think, you know, when we look at other things that we, you know, put ourselves, expose ourselves to, but again, the, um, the risk of interacting and having an injury with a coyote is minimal unless, of course, there's feeding taking place. And so we actually developed um, this Mythbusters card, which is an extremely valuable um, you know, resource that communities do, uh, you know, share, they can download, all of our resources are free to communities and they can download. And this pretty much uh, addresses the, the top five myths that we found very prevalent in communities and with folks, because there, there are stories that have been told so many times that we take it as fact. And I'm sure most of you are aware, but in Ontario, we have Eastern coyotes, um, some people refer to them as koi wolves. I'll get a little bit more into the genetic side of that later on. But um, every coyote that we have here is a mixture of Western coyote and Algonquin wolf, remnant uh, Algonquin wolf DNA. And depending on where the sample set is taken, there could be some ancient dog in there. But we don't have koi dogs running all over the place, which is another <laughs> myth too. Um, coyotes do not abandon their young. They are devoted dedicated parents. If their pups are orphaned, parents are killed and the pups are orphaned. Um, and that coyote stalk people, they will shadow, they'll escort, and if they've been fed, they might uh, exhibit demand behavior, but they're not out looking at human beings as a source of food. And so um, part of the reason too, it's really great that we're able to provide outreach and rescue uh, because when communities can step outside of fear and misinformation, it's really amazing um, when people can help us. They, they'll, you know, allow us to put a live trap, a big box trap on their property, or they'll monitor a spot where we're trying to do outreach, or they allow us to put our research cameras up. And it really does help dispel the myths. And one of the gentlemen actually uh, holding that plastic jar. That little darling had that jar on her head and we're not really sure how long, but as you can see, I mean, I'm we finally got the jar off after an hour and a half. It was so tight and thick onto her uh, neck, but um, the gentleman there that was uh, working with me at the time, he couldn't believe how small coyotes are because they look so large when you're not handling them. But secondly, he had grown up thinking that they were these vicious creatures. And so the scientific classification, and depending on, um, you know, where the research is uh, coming from and who the researchers are, um, you know, for the most part in Ontario, we refer to our coyote, our Canis citrans as Eastern coyotes. 
Um, some folks push the koi wolf term. It's not accurate. It's, they're not half wolf, half coyote. Um, but our Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, the day that they change the terminology and there's some protection measures put in place and we'll follow their lead and uh, call them something else. But um, we do have a researcher in the States who's on our uh, science advisory who does fabulous um, canid research, uh, Dr. Jonathan Way, and he really promotes um, calling them koi wolves with the caveat that they are afforded closed season in terms of hunting. So um, it's pretty self-explanatory as far as the genetic makeup. Depending on, again, who the researcher is, you might see eastern coyotes as um, written as Canis trans variation, Canis trans cross lycian, and there was some suggestion that they should be called Canis orients, uh, which was Dr. Way's um, he was aiming to have that maybe introduced, but regardless of what these animals, their genetic makeup is, um, they've been here for over a century and the DNA has nothing to do with coexistence. And so their ecological and social benefits, uh, for sure, I mean, gosh, if you hear their songs, there's uh, something wild and amazing and their ability to communicate over the miles, but they're now the species is the focus of some pretty uh, groundbreaking research, some exciting research. Um, as far as, you know, ecotourism, people love taking photographs of coyotes, especially their young. And there's a cultural connection within our native communities um, for not only the mythology and the teachings, but also regalia, um, the bone is used and, you know, some really great stuff. But also, um, coyotes keep our zoonotic diseases. They consume uh, copious amounts of rodents and voles, and so they contribute to, um, you know, removing those, uh, those uh, species out of the landscape, like a fox or a possum eats the ticks and also birds of prey and ermine. And so injury and illness. Uh, so Coyotes are, are exposed to a lot of different things, and now um, there's some pretty uh, disturbing, you know, uh, updates and research in terms of, um, you know, imported dogs bringing in uh, different uh, parasites and different diseases, and it's actually impacting our wild canid populations. And the small, smaller French heartworm, which isn't really talked about too much, that actually has um, the ability to cross into the ungulate. So on the East Coast, they're noticing more uh, prevalence with the parasites and um, the French heartworm. So that's one of the um, key things. And they would not have um, really the physiology to master how to um, ward off these different diseases. So they're not going to the vets and getting medications like our dogs. When they have mange, um, we get calls often for coyotes that have hunkered down in barns or laid up against a manure pile where the heat is emanating off. And also uh, the death and disruption. Once the family is fragmented, it's pretty tough um, for them to uh, really a single parent to raise the pups. If, they, if they're not weaned off yet, they would need mom's milk to survive. And so I'm sure a lot of you have seen a coyote or even a, a fox that has uh, the skin condition, the sarcoptic mange. It's treatable. Um, it does impact their immuno response eyesight, and it can be pretty, pretty, uh, pretty painful death. Um, sometimes they can recover. Um, one thing, there is a correlation, though, between uh, environmental poison the rodenticides, neocannicanoids, it actually impacts um, species like coyotes because they're top shelf predators and they're eating um, those rodents that are targeted for the, um, for the poisons. They're exposed to leg hole traps and snares. Uh, Faith is from Fort Erie and we actually rescued him. He went through um, a pretty grueling surgery at Toronto Wildlife Center and he ended up coming out of the, the other side. And that snare was actually 
um, illegally uh, placed in the landscape. So again, the Ministry of Natural Resources would be involved in that. So when we do our, our uh, you know, assessment about communities and their benchmark in terms of where are they at? Why is there conflict in a community? Oftentimes it goes back to, uh, you know, a couple of, of things that are um, pretty obvious, but not always to the folks that are in, in amidst the conflict. The inf lack of enforcement of bylaws, maybe they don't even have a feeding wildlife bylaw. Also um, insufficient signage in the communities, so folks aren't aware that they're there are coyotes living in an area. And also um, often people would reach out and just want lethal response because that's all that there was. Even when I started doing this work in the 90s, you know, they, coexistence and aversion conditioning was virtually unheard of. So being able to assess and look at um, what's missing in the community, how do we get through that and how do we start um, developing a, a coexistence program? And so um, fostering appropriate human behavior, it always comes back to us, right? What are we doing? What are we not doing? What, are, what is our messaging to these very intelligent animals? Are we training them to hang around us and demand food? Um, are we, you know, increasing their anxiety when our dogs are running loose in the bush? So there's many, many, um, you know, wonderful partnerships that we cultivate. So I don't know that there would be any farmers, but we do have a document, um, Wolf Awareness Inc., who is um, one of our, uh, our wolf biologists on our science advisory, Sadie Parr. Um, we contributed to her second edition of the Wolf uh, Awareness Inc. Rancher's Guide. And so if anybody, I won't spend too much time on this slide, but if there's anybody that does have a farm and um, you might want to uh, reach out if you're, uh, having some difficulties or you just want to share your success stories. One thing we noticed though um, that we do find there's an increase in um, you know wildlife and you know people conflict on farms where people are not living there. They're live out farmers we call them or ranchers and uh, so they're really not on site for weeks at a time and so we find that uh, if there's an animal that's in trouble and they end up dying. Well, coyotes, wolves, and every other animal species is going to feed off of that dead animal. And so they mate for life, which is a um, characteristic that many, many folks did not realize. And so it's really important for them to be able to be a stable uh, couple. I mean, I th what do we, I think our divorce rate, what is 49%? Can you imagine these animals? They say they're monogamous for life. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, but they really do uh, forge quite amazing relationships between each other. And so their mode of communication, obviously um, they use other means besides um, their oral cues, but their vocalizations are absolutely fabulous and they're vital for them to defend their territory, to also locate um, members of their family, to keep transient coyotes away. They bark and they whine, they whimper, they howl. And actually Eastern coyotes and red wolf sound very similar. And our Eastern coyotes can sometimes sound like wolves uh, with their howling. Uh, howling uh, repertoire. So we refer to their, um, their musical voices as a bow jest effect because oftentimes it could be one or two coyotes and it sounds like, um, you know, five or six. But it's vital that they have this mode of communication. And so um, this is uh, Patches. So I'm going to try the video. Here we go. <laughs> I'm going to give it a try. Um, we'll see if it works okay, Jamie. Okay. Oh, I know that one. <laughs> Okay, did that work for everyone? Yes. Yep. Yeah. 
Oh, it worked. Yay. The guy was right. <laughs> okay. So that was Patches in the city of Toronto in Roding Park. And the fire siren went by. And so, um, you know, sometimes they're inspired to let out a really beautiful song for fire <laughs> engines, uh, you know, trains going by and just other dogs barking. So obviously you can see she's not chomping down and killing something, which is, uh, you know, the uh, myth that surrounds their vocalizations too. So that just gives you a, a good idea, a scale of the coyote um, to the dog, to the red fox, to the wolf. And when we see wild canines navigating through the landscape, you'll see them move in linear patterns. So they are very great, at, they're great conservers of energy. And so they're going to be moving through the landscape and not meandering like a domestic dog would all over the place. And in the winter time, you can see that. And so there's a great example of an Eastern coyote uh, track in mud. So you have to consider the substrate that you're looking at um, when you're doing your scaling and your measurements. And sometimes uh, moisture gets into a mud and it expands the track. So they're roughly around two and a half to three inches. Um, and their average weight is roughly 38 pounds. So when they're walking on frozen ice or uh, just barely frozen, they're going to make it whereas a heavier dog will not. They leave their scent behind. Um, that's their, basically they're leaving their imprints, their imprinting data, physical data for all the other canids that are um, passing through or living in that area. And of course that gorgeous fruity scat. And so we use um, a sighting report system for the city of Niagara Falls and some of our other um, community partners like the city of Oakville, Toronto, um, uh, city of Vaughan, many, many communities now rely on mapping to provide that quick snapshot. And we don't, we don't provide a public uh, visual of the maps that we do uh, because in the same area, you're going to have um, countless reports of the, same, of the same coyote navigating through. But what it does help us is identify areas where probably food is taking place, like at the cemetery, park, a trail system, or construction site. So it's great. So we can deploy our canine response teams. So you can see the little mom inside there. She's right there. And I'm at the mouth of the den. This was the den that we used for, um, uh, we were involved in a documentary for Japan. And they came over and were filming here. But anyway, she, Sorry, my husband can't resist his ice cream. <laughs> Sorry about that noise. <laughs> um, so there, uh, the female, uh, her gestation period, there's only a very, very short window when she comes into heat in February. Um, so unlike domesticated dogs, they have the capability of um, having their first family within the first year. But a lot of coyotes don't two to three years later, and they don't always have a family every year either. And so um, they're going to choose places in more rural areas that are natural. In a cityscape, they are going to seek out, you know, locations that they can eco to living in a small five acre area and really, re you know, remain anonymous like ghosts within the cityscape. Um, they are diurnal, but you know, we've found more and more now that coyotes will do what they have to do if they need to feed their families or they have to navigate through. They're going to do that in all, uh, all daylight or during the night. And so there's, um, they're born attritional, so their eyes are closed and their ears are down. In that lower picture there, I think there's probably about 19 pups there. And, uh, um, but the mortality rate is extremely high within the first year. Um, so many, many of them will not survive. And the second, the above slide, you can see the eyes are open, but the ears aren't quite up. So they're just roughly around two and a half uh, weeks old. And mom and dad co-parent. And sometimes a sibling from the year before, an older brother or sister might come back to help. 
uh, raise the family with mom and dad, but then they disperse after that. And the pups will be weaned about five to six weeks. Once those pups are weaned and they move the pups to a rendezvous site, the den really isn't used again. So some folks think that dens are used during the winter and fall. They are not. Um, they basically are there for the raising uh, mum feeding the pups in the den and then they will go outside and explore beyond in their in their territory and once the pups are weaned mum and dad will provide um, regurgitated soft food and so um, family is everything for coyotes they maintain that territory and there's a lot of um, movement uh, from the young, sometimes they disperse in the fall, sometimes they don't leave the first year or they leave in the springtime. It used to be said uh, pretty much in cement that they disperse in the fall and we know for a fact that that's just not accurate anymore. But I think it depends a lot too on what's happening in their territory and how much uh, space and the food resources. And so without mom and dad, the pups cannot learn how to be coyotes and so it's really important to keep both mom and dad um, functioning and alive and safe and able to raise their families and so that's now from the den mom and dad would move the pups to what we call a rendezvous site and so oftentimes this is when folks will call us and say pups are abandoned there's no parents around they're on their own and we basically give families sometimes 24 to 48 hours. We'll set up cameras, we'll make sure, but we can tell pretty much out of the shoot if mom and dad are around. They know where these pups are at all times, but they're also out hunting now. So they're going to leave the pups, go out and hunt and bring food back. And eventually these little uh, pups will follow uh, mom and dad. And so a situation like this resting in the backyard, for whatever reason they chose to be there and everything was fine, um, 24, as I said, 48 hours, and then we determine has something happened, especially in rural areas, the risk of them, uh, parents being shot is pretty high. So coyotes are adaptive omnivores. Their diets are incredible. Um, I'm not really a fan of, uh, the description that they eat just about anything because we've had the joy and pleasure of um, studying some coyotes that are pretty picky. They eat well and a well-balanced diet, but um, you know, there could be a dead animal laying on the path like a raccoon or a possum and they will not eat that animal. They might uh, leave a scat on top of it, but they're not consuming it. They will eat things from fish, uh, right down to uh, carrion food, insects, snails, they eat nuts. They're very, very resilient fruit and therefore that's why we really cannot be providing them uh, food provisions. It just sets them up for failure. And that's a deer, uh, that's big red down there. And if you notice his ears separated, so when a coyote does that with it, um, his or her ears, that's a sign of insecurity and they're pretty much frightened and he didn't stay too long there. He bolted out of there after about uh, maybe eight, nine seconds. But that deer was hit by a train and uh, Big Red and his family cleaned that deer up in three days. <laughs> and so just looking at uh, the spatial temporal diet, this is um, Lukasik uh, and Alexander's research, just to give you a little bit of an idea. Um, Coyotes. Now, there is one uh, research paper that came out of LA that showed a pretty high uh, percentage, about 13% of cat, but in relativeness, I guess it wouldn't be, but if it's your cat, it would be uh, important. But if you look at the various um, choices of diet here and the availability, um, if you look at the domestic animals, is 1.24, which is so low. And yet people think that coyotes are, you know, uh, consumers of domestic pets. Now, out of those six samples, there was close to 500. Out of those six, um, 
they couldn't really determine whether the animal was, uh, what kind of domestic animal it was and whether it was alive or dead. So I think it's really important. We understand the relationship with coyotes and domestic dogs. It could be territorial defense or protection, but they're not killing dogs and consuming them. What often happens is um, they will carry a dog away. They drop the dog and a lot of other animal species in the environment might consume that um, unfortunate diseased animal. And so as far as navigating in urban spaces, one of the best research, 20-year uh, research actually um, in urban areas is uh, Dr. Stan Gert, and he has some absolutely fabulous uh, data and statistics, but they are amazing at navigating throughout cities. They teach their young how to cross roads. They know when the lights change, they're just absolutely fabulous at navigating and really um, you know if there's fencing that goes up or there's a change in infrastructure it will impact them so you could have had a family in an area um, but you never saw them before all of a sudden fencing goes up or a highway system and all of a sudden now you're seeing coyotes it doesn't mean that necessarily that there's more it's just there's been a change in the landscape and movement patterns and they are absolutely brilliant at connecting green spaces. Um, they will have territories. Again, if you have a chance, um, look at Dr. Gert's research because the, the territorial um, design is just amazing. And so moving from the backyard to the trail, the respect and the reverence and restraint is so important for coyotes and all other wildlife species. Um, we are encountering more and more now. It's so prevalent and so, so um, really uh, it's corrupting wildlife behavior. A lot of photographers are now uh, baiting to take photographs, right? They'll be calling and baiting and using scent attractants and all sorts of things. And it really does have a negative effect on these amazing uh, animals and all the other animals. And so we look at communities if there's conflict we look at uh, hot spots and we will do an investigation. And that is just a case study of an area where there was infrastructure change and a lot of construction going on, which dispersed rodents, in particular rats. And so there was a lot of mitigative efforts that had to go into this location. But if we didn't get out into the field and actually do the legwork and gather the um, evidence and the data, it would be really hard to figure out why all of a sudden coyotes are starting to come into a particular area and there was just such an abundance of uh, rats that they were showing up and there was other issues barbecue and uh, food provisions being provided and cat and dog food outdoors but for the most part it was uh, mainly for the rodents and so with this investigation here um, we actually came across a poaching uh, situation. I was seeing a prevalence of deer hair in coyote scat, which I knew was not common in this particular area where we were investigating. Anyways, long story short, as you can see at the bottom, there was piles and piles of deer that had been decapitated, um, but the coyotes were coming in and eating um, the remains. And so we were able to provide that information uh, because it wasn't poaching, uh, you know, hunting wasn't allowed in, in this particular area. But when we do uh, field work and investigations, um, we have annual uh, conference and workshop training sessions. And we were lucky enough to have um, one of the best instructors uh, provide information on, um, you know, doing a uh, inspection and uh, basically like a crime scene analysis, OPP, scene management training. And so any of the new reps now that come through that, we also impart that methodology. So we have a very, very strict, tight, um, perfected method of gathering evidence in the field if it had to go to a court of law. And so just sealing up under Neath buildings. You folks, now it's the fall. Winter time is right before us. 
and we need to seal up all of those outbuildings so these animals don't decide to utilize them in the spring because they will always be looking around, right? This, this photo actually now is part of the campaign, education campaign for the city of Toronto. And uh, carbohydrate food is so bad for wild canids, especially when they have sarcoptic mange. It's just, there's no nutrition in human food for these animals. And it's such a, it's a real betrayal um, to their intelligence and their ability to provide for their families. And so here we have patches again in the middle of the park. Um, we were lucky enough to discover that she was being fed by uh, this well-meaning gentleman. And he had a German Shepherd dog who would lay down and patches would come up and eat right out uh, of the gentleman's hand and also um, off of the ground. But she was able to turn the corner and we did some aversion conditioning. And she's now, you know, she, she doesn't go to this park and get fed anymore. So I'm gonna try it again, okay folks, the video, and you'll see Patches eating dog food on the ground. Here we go, I hope it works. <laughs> That was quick. Did it work? Yep. Did it actually work? Yes. Oh my gosh, that is amazing. Remember how much trouble we had the last time? Yeah. So you folks got to see the real thing. Yeah, so that dog food rotted her teeth. Anyways, um, and of course, there's dogs in this park. Off leash, they're not supposed to be, but so patches, that was her, her turf. And dogs would be seen as competition. And so having an altercation with a domestic dog would be expected. But amazingly enough, she really did not have too many negative encounters with uh, domestic dogs. And so again, going into uh, an increase in sighting in a community, we think right off the bat, what's changed? Is there infrastructure change or is there food provisions being provided uh, by a, a resident or a few. And so when we get those calls from residents that are alarmed, we will go out and do that investigation. And in this particular case, um, a neighbor, the only neighbor on the street was providing um, food for this coyote and like clockwork every day that coyote would walk behind all the houses and go right to that person's backyard. And you can see all the food provisions that were put there. Once the food provisions were removed, that coyote did not waste much time going back to that backyard again. And so we have to also think about, um, we remove retract attractants from our backyards, but also uh, our canids can, can climb, like fox and coyotes are very great at climbing. And also domestic dogs can climb and dig out from underneath you know, fences. So if you have a little dog, the days of letting that animal out on their own, especially with birds of prey, um, or they they just wander or somebody takes the dog, it's really risky. But I think it's important to remember that um, we, you know, our backyards are not really places where we can leave our pets alone. So I would like you to look at this photo, and if anybody would like to answer what they think is happening in this photo. Does anybody have any thoughts on it? Anybody? Are, do you think- Are the pups playing? Are they playing? No. Well, what, what else is in that photo? Do you think that's a natural- No, it looks like the area between a highway and a, oh. and a road. Oh, yeah. Looks like yeah. you're crossing the road. But what well, do you see in the right? What's in the right hand corner here? Car. Can't see it. So there's a car. The road. So there, there's a car there. And oh, really? that family mm -hmm. was being fed by vehicles. So vehicles <laughs> oh. would pull up. Mom would bring the pups to the boulevard. Right, okay, picture. There's a car down here. Yeah. Well, try to picture. feed. Yeah, so, but oftentimes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but this is, 
This is a really bad situation because domestic dogs could be coming through there. Um, people could hit one of the pups or there being food conditions. So this was a really, really rough, rough situation, but aversion conditioning was, um, was deployed and this family, uh, she ended up moving her pups and, and she stopped coming there, but people did get fined. And so there's a process called aversion conditioning or hazing. And this essentially helps um, these lovely, intelligent wild creatures to, to really um, you know, rely back on their instincts to stay away from people. And so uh, version conditioning is not new. People uh, have been using it with uh, big cats and bears uh, for many, many years. Um, they're using it with elephants, different methodologies, but our version conditioning is absolutely deployed to reshape canid behavior. And so um, our reps are trained for version conditioning uh, deployment and First, of, first and foremost, so we're going to identify the food resources and remove them, and then also work in partnership or tandem with um, hum, uh, you know, humane societies, animal control, animal bylaw. It's really, really important. So body gesturing and being assertive and confident is really, really important. And aversion conditioning, it's a lifelong tool. It's not something that you do on its own. It has to be part of an overall coexistence program. And also recognizing that each wild animal that we could come in contact with, we have no idea what that animal has been exposed to before us. And whether we're feeding or not, or whether we have our dog on a leash or not, they have memories and they have experiences and that is going to impact how they behave towards you and human indifference seeing a you know an animal on a trail that is just waiting for a handout that's not an appropriate response and so keeping coyotes away we have a document called keeping coyotes away which is very very popular um, it's a, a great resource it clearly outlines what you can do if you're out hiking for example um, you can carry a green garbage bag and snap the garbage bag, fill it with air and snap it. It's very frightening for them because it's not something they see and hear all the time. Popping an umbrella. Whistles are okay, but in an urban location, whistling is not so, um, it's not going to be as effective because they're around soccer fields, they're near playgrounds, they're hearing those kinds of stimuli. So we suggest, you know what, just use your voice, be very loud. One thing for sure though, you do not turn your back and run from any um, domestic dog or wild canid. And, um, you know, using a water hose in the summertime, that can be a deterrent, but tractant removal is the most important thing. And so not providing those food sources and being very firm and very, very um, consistent in the messaging. And so our high five for safety, we have um, education programs, cool, um, cool canids, high five for safety, and we do the um, teaching programs, but these are actually really great. Um, the high fives, uh, the five S's for safety, even for adults, because if you do happen to see a coyote and you're walking your dog, keep your dog close, uh, pick up your small dog or a small child and be very, very firm. Don't turn your back. And if you stand still, try to gain your composure. And then with very, very swift and uh, assertive motions, waving and uh, slapping your hands and just being very, very assertive and in control. Slowly backing away and sharing the experience. While in communities, you can report your sighting or you share it within your naturals groups. But if a coyote is uh, shadowing you, which I'll get into, there could be other reasons for that. And so you only under extremely um, unique and special situations would we ever want to ever try to um, create any kind of tension for a mom with her babies or a dad with the babies because 
this is their family. They're very protective. Domestic dogs to uh, a mom or dad uh, coyote is a threat and a predator. And so oftentimes there will be an increase in conflict during these times. And so we just have to be very, very cautious how we uh, behave and we need to give them space uh, when they're, um, you know, raising their families. And our aversion conditioning, we just actually had our publication. <laughs> it's out now. We're pretty excited about it um, because it will be a great uh, document for communities that are investigating and hoping to create a coexistence program um, and using non-lethal approaches to mitigating conflict. So uh, my, my research partner, Lauren Van Patter and I um, were really, really pleased about that. You can always look at it if anybody's interested, uh, reach out to me um, and I can send you a copy. We actually made it um, free access so everybody could um, have access to this, not just the scientific community. So um, we're very excited about that. So people, dogs and coyotes, um, you know, as I said, they're from the same family, but dogs again are, you know, they're, ter they're territorial. Uh, coyotes are living out in natural spaces, whereas our dogs come and, you know, sleep with us at, at, at home in a warm, cozy place. And the best thing to prevent conflict is using a leash. Even in an area that's a leash-free place, um, not only uh, is it wise to do it for the dog, it's also good because there's ground nesting birds. There's all sorts of, you know, um, reptiles, amphibians, uh, and I love my dog, but I know that my dog, that prey instinct and, you know, the need to uh, grab at things and damage things, it's really, really bad. So um, it's important. Coyotes will shadow a person and their dog out of an area, especially if young are nearby or a den or they have a fresh kill. Let's say, for example, they just killed a rabbit or a squirrel um, or a beaver. They are going to be very protective of that food because they are working hard for that. And so recognizing, too, the seasonal milestones, um, they're highly sensitive and can be very stressed by the presence of dogs that are off leash. And they can be injured, they can be killed, and the dog could be injured or killed. And so recognizing that time of year is really important. My uh, friend and colleague, Janet Kessler, that photograph up at the top is of a dog chasing the coyote. Uh, we often more overhear about coyotes chasing dogs, but they're doing that because they're being defensive or protective. And so in this instance here, both the coyote and the dog could end up being injured. But while that coyote is running, he or she is also using up a very vital energy reserve. And so they're running and trying to escape or they eventually stop and turn around and defend themselves. And that's when they'll bite the hind ends of a, of a, of a domestic dog. And uh, below there, the feeding. Once um, coyotes are in an area and they're being fed and dogs are in that area, sometimes that can create a, a huge tension in a conflict because now that dog is really competition for that food. And so that is some food that was provided at a park on a daily basis, that junky food for wild animals that need very, very healthy food. So there's no nutrition in there whatsoever. Um, and it was also drawing the family out. This, is, this was a photograph taken this year from a cemetery. And cemeteries can be hot spots, construction sites. And so that demand behavior we might see in a coyote as a coyote grabbing the back of a knapsack, grabbing someone's bag. You know, the gentleman that fed that uh, patches for that entire year, he would come every day with a plastic uh, garbage bag full of dog food. And so uh, there was a couple of times where patches did walk towards people thinking that they might provide that food for her too. But we don't want that behavior, and it's really important that we can mitigate that with aversion conditioning before it escalates. And so again, 
the vocalizations, coyotes are very capable of barking and doing yips and howls. Um, if they are barking or they're howling, it could be that you're stressing them out. If you're walking on your own, you could be near uh, a den site. If they start barking or jumping up and down or arching your back, they're trying to communicate to you and your dog to leave the area. And so just always be cognizant of what that coyote's doing. And if the mouth is open and that back is arched like a cat, all that coyote is trying to do is communicate, please leave. And at that moment when you decide to leave, the coyote might shadow you or follow you for a distance. Okay. And so at the end, that's a little sweetie Eastern coyote pup. Um, that oh. obviously that pup would not be able to survive without mom and dad to take care or us um, bringing uh, that pup to rehab. But, you know, it's our hope that, you know, you take away some information tonight that maybe opened your eyes to these animals in a different way. Um, and, you know, maybe perhaps uh, folks, if you have photos or you know of areas where there's a, a family, a local family that lives there, any kind of information uh, for our research and study would be welcomed and very, very helpful. So any questions? <laughs> Thank you so much. And sorry for that mess up. Oh my gosh, that you guys have been great. It was great, Leslie. Thank you very much. Any questions? Questions? Can Jamie, how do we get across questions? Uh, hmm. Maybe if people just try to turn on their mics and start talking, that might be the easiest way. Can we turn on mics? Can you turn on the mics? Well, I can turn on people. Uh, I can ask people to turn on their mics. Right. We're, we're gonna, I'm gonna try but to can't look. you? Can't you, Jamie, turn the mics on? No, I, I can't. I can turn them off. I just can't yeah. actually turn them on. I can just request oh. that they turn these on. I just left. Leave me. Mr. Robson, me. Oh, somebody's. Oh, Frank. Frank said to everyone, you could ask your question there. Oh yes, chat. Yeah. If if you can't if you can't folks uh, get your microphone on, can't they? Oh, the mute, would they have their mute the same place I have mine? Yes. Yeah, if they could just go up, can't they see where my mute is and then try to find theirs? So you're dating audio, no? Hold on, I'm going to have a question. <laughs> Yay! Am I coming? <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> okay. So one winter while we were skiing in a conservation area, we came across um, the somewhat eaten body of a deer. So would a coyote have killed a deer by itself or a so pair? That's a fabulous question. So some, some of the, so I think everyone's aware of the size of a deer. Deer can kill me if they want or a dog or a coyote one lone coyote no um, there was some research that suggested that you know they could utilize fawn but a full-grown deer would be pretty formidable however deer get hit by vehicles deer get shot by bow bullet whatever and if you don't look at the body for any kind of wound entry or whatever, a deer can die from natural causes. And yes, coyotes would absolutely, because that's what Big Red was doing on the railway. But a lone coyote is not going to be able to take a, a full a, a deer down. First mm -hmm. of all, they wouldn't be able to catch them. Secondly, their hooves would kill them. And for, for coyotes, they're negotiating life and death all the time. When they have smaller food sources, a deer is pretty tough. Wolves, on, an, on the other hand, 
they are consummate family pack hunters. And so there's great number there. They're growing up in a family that's teaching them how to do that. Now, when you get around Algonquin Park, though, things can be a little bit different because we have some interesting genetics there where there are some uh, canids that have a lot more. Um, there'll be Algonquin wolf and some gray wolf um, genetic mm. presence there. So, But it's hard to know. But there's things that you can look at. If there's an animal, um, if there's tracks of struggling, how fresh is the blood? Next time you come across something, take a picture of it and then send it to us. But you need to look at the entire area, not just the deceased animal. You have to look at all the activity and the evidence, especially in snow, it can tell you a great story. Great question. Great, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I have a question. Am I coming through? Yes. Yes, Julian. Yes, beautiful. There was not much uh, hybridization between domestic dogs and coyotes? No. So um, the genetic work that Dr. Brent Patterson did, it's less than 0.02%. So there's a couple of factors in there. Now, that's not to say that people don't uh, go out of their way to have um, coyote dog, wolf dog, I mean, it can be a real issue, especially in the States. But what happens is, first of all, a female dog can have essentially almost basically two litters in a year. Female coyotes come into heat once a year in February. She also has her partner. This whole notion of coy dogs, that's something that was uh, really... I don't even know who started it. I mean, they can, they can mate absolutely. Um, coyotes would never be mating with a fox and fox don't mate with dogs. But uh, wolf, Algonquin wolf, yes, with Eastern coyotes. But the gray wolf, no. And that's another uh, misinformation. There is some back crossing, but that genetic influence comes through the conduit of the Algonquin wolf. So secondly, um, domestic male dogs are deadbeat dads. They're not going to be able to provide for the female. How do they know how to hunt and provide for that female? How do they know how to hunt and maintain a territory and ensure that the family is safe and that that territory is for his family? And so, no, that I... I know that the koi dog notion is something that everybody likes to kind of throw around, but really and truly this, the science and the genetics don't support it. It doesn't mean it can't happen, but um, you know, and there's a lot of dogs that end up, uh, you know, loose or lost. They end up, uh, you know, roaming in places where there are coyote families. And surprisingly enough, um, those dogs end up, not being killed or harmed, and they end up being rescued by different um, rescue organizations. Mm. Yeah. That's did you hear? Cool. Did you hear though about the koi dog? What's your name, sir? Uh, Julian Winter. Oh, Julian. Oh, okay. I saw you earlier. Yeah. Um, it is a real myth that is talked about like a fact. Well, it's I've not seen to it in say the that they someplace. can't. Pardon? Because there was something in the press a little while back about uh, some problems with, uh, with, with hybridization and the, and, and the hybrid was particularly uh, dangerous. Yeah. So I think maybe two different things here. So the Eastern Coyote does have remnant wolf DNA and Western Coyote. Okay, so um, that hybridization, that occurred over a hundred years ago. But I think when they try to suggest that coyotes and dogs are running around, is that what the media article said? Something well, to that effect? Yeah, something like that. But, uh, you know, it would have appeared yeah. in something like the Globe and Mail or the Toronto Star. That's the kind of stuff I read. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but yeah. we've had our issues with the uh, scientific discussion in those papers, too. Um, no, if we're talking about Eastern Coyote, 
We're not talking about koi dogs. And so um, suggesting that we have a, a, a bunch of koi dogs running around out there is just not, it's just not factual and there's no science to even back that assumption up. And I would love, if you can find that, Julian, please shoot it to me. I'd love to read that. But it won't be the first time that I, I have heard that uh, the media has promoted that notion that these koi dogs are running around. But that's a reporter that hasn't done their homework. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? Well, I have another question about foxes and coyotes because we have some very yes. nice foxes that are running around Coburg. And yes. <laughs> uh, I was wondering whether there was a bit of competition going on here, whether foxes make uh, good coyote food. So another great question. We, you know, 90s, 80s, and even now there are some researchers that still promote this. I don't know how many of you out there have seen fox and coyote sharing the same landscape. I won't say necessarily a territory, but they're sharing the landscape. How many of you, probably all of you have seen coyotes and fox in the same area. And so yes, they do often rely on the same food sources, but we have families, uh, red fox families and coyotes that have lived, uh, I won't say, uh, I won't say cohabitated well together, but they've, they've shared the same, the same uh, land. And so they're going after the same food sources. But when are we ever running out of rodents and voles? And there's fruit. And then there's people feeding in parks and all of those things. So when there's conflict, um, you know, usually what we're seeing, we don't see it between the fox and coyotes. But you, in Coburg, we had reports about coyotes. Um, there were some coyote sightings in Coburg too. I've seen them. Yeah. They run up and yeah. down our street. Yeah. I've seen them in the parks. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think they run, I think they use the, uh, the railroad line as a, as a car door yes. come down the, the creeks. They do. The railway, the creek beds, um, old right of ways, any, and our trail system. So they're going to use the paths of least resistance that are safe and they can navigate, but sometimes they have to go through our cities too. You know, they do utilize our road systems too for traveling. Any, any other questions? I have a question. Um, Please. Can you hear this is Louise in Nova Scotia. Oh, hey, Louise, how are you? <laughs> good, good. I am just wondering if uh, your group is active uh, in Nova Scotia. Um, as you're probably aware, there was um, a death yep. in Cape Breton National Park. And, um, I, and that was before we moved here. And I hear a lot of stories about that. And uh, Anyways, I, I'm just, there, there's a lot of misinformation out there. People are really afraid of coyotes here. And I, I would think that they would benefit from more education. Um, and so I just wondered if your group was active here. And uh, I, I'm hoping they are. <laughs> well, we are always um, looking for um, volunteer recruits. Nova Scotia was uh, a, a little bit of a, um, because they, they had actively had the call program running after, yeah. and it was Taylor, Taylor Mitchell. I normally don't um, talk about the Mitchell family because of, uh, you know, I can't even imagine what uh, Emily, her mom, goes through, and I don't like using her daughter's death as a topic for discussion. However, having said that, and it is a more of an intimate forum, um, that situation in Cape Breton Highlands, there was so much feeding going on there. Even afterwards, the research, actually Stan Gert was working in Cape Breton Highlands too. Um, Sam and Gabois, who is also uh, a scientist out your neck of the woods, Louise. So, um, we would welcome having, we do have a representative, but he is 
off the radar because he actually uh, works for the government. So um, he does uh, provide um, important information for us if we, you know, need to uh, maybe flex a little bit out in that area. But we do need to have a, a presence, a stronger presence there. But there is a lot, so much misinformation. Actually, some of the data um, at the in this on the website for the government, there's some interesting um, data that's on that website. I won't say anything more about that now, but okay. check it out. Check it yeah. out. Yeah. But, you know, maybe if you're interested, if you're there, I mean, there's subtle ways that you can slowly in a community introduce these animals and on my own and think oh but there's coyotes so it's uh, it's, it's a pervasive attitude but uh, i'm always happy to hear them howling oh things, that's so thank, anyways, thank you, you. <laughs> any other questions it's the pervasive attitude there is kill the coyotes yes mm. yes anybody there's else sorry go ahead no, well, there's folks like Louise that really do love and and appreciate, uh, but there has to be a paradigm shift there, and it's never too late. But the way to get do that is through art, and um, the that kind of uh, celebration, and then you encourage, and then you start getting hunters that are providing their photographs, or they do an art carving, and then you start breaking down those barriers of disinformation, basically. Hmm. Coyotes bring up a memory we had, oh, three or two or three or four years ago. Friday Mullet came for supper one night. You told me, that is amazing. Like I'm thinking, is he joking <laughs> and with in me the, or what? In the middle, and it was in the winter time around, it was about what, December, January, whatever. And, uh, those were the days that I smoked. I don't anymore. And uh, I went out and I heard the coyotes howling in the back fields from our house. So I went and got him and he came out and damn it all if he didn't talk to the coyotes. He kept a conversation <laughs> going between himself and these coyotes for about half an hour. It was the most amazing thing. Yeah. And it really was great. Uh, unfortunately, because of the bloody buildings and the stuff that's going on around our area now, we're not hearing the coyotes anymore, which is sad. It is sad. I, it's sad when I, even my families that I spend a, a great deal of time with out in the bush, um, when I stop hearing them, even my, where I live, I'm on the escarpment and we have you know, the serenade and we have the regular deer and the fox and coyotes going through here. Um, but boy, when they stop vocalizing, I think, is it because they're dead? You know, I get very concerned about that and you'll never get used to it. Mm -hmm. So. You can always tell when the farmers are shooting the coyotes because all of a sudden the rabbits start taking yeah. over. <laughs> and, when the, yeah. and then when the coyotes population comes back, the rabbit population drops. But you know, Tim, having said that, there are so many farmers and ranchers that don't kill native carnivores. Like, yep. you know, but you don't hear, we don't hear those stories. If you look at that wolf awareness, the rancher's guide, um, our contribution, I think is page 36 or 28. I can't remember. Anyway, it's the top 10 things of successful ranchers and farmers and why they never had any issues with, um, coyotes or wolves even please walk the dog <laughs> we will He's, in a few again. minutes <laughs> <laughs> like, like no, he, I mean, every we, time. we would we would hear we would hear the 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 guns going off at night and oh, uh that's back illegal in the, no it's back in the back you know we 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 border onto the country side we're not in the town and so you'd hear them shooting and sure enough, about six, eight, 10 months later, you would notice the population of rabbits would start increasing. And uh, 
when the coyotes would start making a comeback, we would notice that the rabbit population would start dropping again. Well, anyway, Leslie, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it and enjoyed your talk immensely. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I do apologize for the screw well, up before. Oh my it's gosh. Called, it's, you start sweating, it's called, right? com it's called computers. Oh, walk the dog, please. Um, you know, <laughs> hey, let me know. It's like, you know what? My family doesn't leave me alone. And then as soon as I need them to walk the dog, nobody's ever around. Um, when it comes on uh, the website, will I be able to look at that? Yep. Oh, that's well, well, I'll let you know. Yeah, but look at that taping. But if anybody has any other questions, though, they can always email me. Yep. Okay. I will, I will let them know. Tim, and thank you, Tim for getting this all set up and for everybody spending time to get together tonight. It was really great and an honor to be able to share with you folks. Anyway, with that, I will say good night to you and to everybody else.